Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is January 30th, 2015, and my guest is Ben Steele, Senior Fellow and Director of International Economics at the Council on Foreign Relations. His latest book is The Battle of Bretton Woods, John Maynard Keynes, Harry Dexter White, and the Making of a New World Order. And that book is the topic of our conversation. Ben, welcome to Econ Talk. Thanks for having me, Russ. Now, Bretton Woods was a legendary international conference in 1944 toward the end of World War II with the goal of creating an international monetary system to correct some of the perceived problems in international trade and the health of the world's economies. But to understand what happened there, uh, we have to go back, as you do in your book, to before World War II. And uh, what went wrong with monetary policy and trade in the 1930s? If you want to understand what went wrong with monetary and trade policy in the 1930s, I think you have to go back to the eve of World War I. Uh, That was formally the ending of the uh, classical gold standard. Uh, When countries went back on the gold standard in the 1920s, they were really operating under very different premises. Uh, In the late 19th century, for example, when uh, a dollar was sent out of the United States for the purchase of goods abroad, uh, gold would flow out of the United States and interest rates would have to come up in order to attract it back. And this natural correspondence between money flows and gold flows uh, tended to uh, alleviate uh, what we today call global imbalances. But in the 1920s, countries were no longer obeying what you might call the golden rule of the gold standard. That is, when gold flowed out, they did not raise interest rates. When gold flowed in, they did not lower interest rates. The United States and and France in particular were, quote-unquote, sterilizing gold inflows. That that is, um, uh, they were hoarding gold, uh, but they were not allowing uh, monetary conditions to be determined based on the the movement of gold. This uh, particularly created grievous problems for uh, Britain. Uh, which went back on to the gold standard, which was now really a gold exchange standard in 1925 at the same parity it had left the gold standard on in uh, 1914, despite the inflation it had suffered during the, the war. And this created enormous economic and political frictions um, among these three countries. Now, from the perspective of the United States, It was Britain exiting the gold exchange standard in 1931 that um, set off a series of um, uh, currency and trade wars that spread the um, Great Depression globally and created the environment of misery and anger that paved the path to aggression for the European dictators, Hitler and Mussolini. So they were very, very much... Um, the U.S. Treasury in the 1940s, economic determinists in explaining um, how we came to the um, eve of uh, World War II. And they were determined to create a new international monetary system founded on the U.S. dollar that would eliminate um, uh, competitive devaluations permanently. Of course, these were competitive devaluations against the U.S. dollar. This is what they were fundamentally most concerned with. We've done a bunch of episodes, and I encourage uh, listeners to go back and listen to – we had one with Tom Rustici on Smoot-Hawley and the role of tariffs in in, in creating the Great Depression – And Doug Irwin, uh, an extensive conversation about France's behavior in this period that that you're alluding to. Uh, There's a – before we go into the details of um, what happened at Bretton Woods and the players, which are utterly fascinating. It's an amazing book and I learned a shockingly large amount. I'm uh, both proud and ashamed to say. Um, But let's talk just for a second about the inherent tension uh, 
between being part of an international monetary system and having control over your own fate. So it seems to me that the history of these these efforts, Bretton Woods being one of them, is this tension between uh, you want to be able to trade with your neighbors, interact with your neighbors, accept their currencies, uh, your people, and yet at the same time you want to be able to control your interest rate, your inflation, stimulate your economy if you can or need to. And these goals conflict often, and there's an inherent uh, trade-off there that nobody really likes to deal with. That's right. Um, in, in the 1930s, there was a mad scramble for gold, which was still really the uh, foundation of the uh, global monetary system. And it was very much embedded in people's uh, psyches. Gold was to people around the world um, uh, money. It was the foundation of the uh, national monies that were uh, printed up. Um, and uh, over the course of the 1930s into the 1940s, uh, as the United States was accumulating more and more gold, the U.S. dollar became the only credible surrogate for gold um, uh, in the world. Uh, so if you didn't have uh, significant reserves of gold or U.S. dollars, uh, you were forced basically to resort to barter um, uh, in order to trade. Um, now, the United what's wrong, States… What's wrong with that? Explain what that well, is because barter yeah. in everyday life is different sure, than barter at the national level. So. Uh, uh, basically, we, we're, we're talking about one country sendi sending, say, uh, uh, commodities to another country in, in return for um, a, a fixed amount of, of finished goods. Um, countries, for example, today like um, uh, Iran – um, that are um, uh, faced with economic sanctions often have to re uh, resort uh, to barter, and it's naturally a very inefficient uh, way of, of, of trading. So the uh, monetary chaos of the 1930s, as you had this mad scramble for uh, gold and dollars, was one of the causes uh, of um, the collapse in uh, international trade. So let's turn to the Bretton, Wood Con Bretton Woods Conference, uh, and I'm going to confess that I always thought that uh, John Maynard Keynes had crafted the institutions that emerged from that, the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, the World Bank, and the World Trade Organization, the WTO. Uh, your mm -hmm. book explains that's not true. Uh, it was really the vision of Harry Dexter White, uh, a, a figure that I, whose name I'd heard of, but turns out to be a rather extraordinary uh, figure in this in this story and in the ramifications for all kinds of things, including uh, Soviet espionage, which is really remarkable. But let's start with for, forgetting the details of, of White versus Keynes, which we're going to get to. What was the idea behind what emerged from Bretton Woods? What was the goal of the IMF? We'll put the WTO to the side. The WTO is simple, relatively, it was to try to get the world to have lower tariffs. Uh, and to trade more. But let's talk about the IMF and the World Bank. When it, they were conceived in 1944 and, and when, in the aftermath of Bretton Woods, what role were they going to play a, in the international monetary system? Well, let, let's start with the World Bank so we can sort of get that off the table relatively quickly. By the time we get to the Bretton Woods conference, there really is very little controversy uh, about the World Bank. It's not going to be a very important geopolitical institution, at least in comparison with the International Monetary Fund. Um, uh, it was uh, called at the time the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Note that the word reconstruction comes before development. Um, its main role was going to be uh, to assist in uh, financing the reconstruction of Europe after the war. Um, now, uh, a number of nations, particularly those in Latin America, uh, objected to um, having their scarce dollars uh, put to use reconstructing um, Europe, and that was um, a part of the reason why the development function of this um, uh, institution was um, uh, tacked on. Um, that was a compromise. Yeah, and uh, eventually, of course, it, be, it uh, became the dominant role of the World Bank. But there was enormous controversy in the two-year run-up um, to the Bretton Woods Conference between the United States and Great Britain over the International Monetary Fund, which was clearly going to be a very, very important um, uh, geopolitical institution. 
Um, the biggest uh, controversy between the two of them um, was uh, over the, the role of the U.S. dollar in the post-war uh, order. Um, uh, John Maynard Keynes, who was the head of the British delegation at Bretton Woods, fought relentlessly uh, with the Americans about this. He wanted the U.S. dollar to have no special role in the international monetary architecture. Um, he had proposed a new supranational currency, which was to be called uh, Bancor, which he hoped over time would to come to supplant the dominant international role of the U.S. dollar. Um, the Americans, and Harry Dexter White in particular, would have absolutely uh, none of this. They actually wanted to give the United States even more of a privileged role um, uh, than it had at, on the eve of the conference in 1944. And they were in a powerful negotiating position because of the fact that the U.S. at the time controlled about two-thirds of the world's uh, monetary gold reserves. Now, at Bretton Woods, Harry Dexter White used a, a number of rather remarkable ruses in order to have the U.S. dollar uh, and only the U.S. dollar declare the equivalent of gold for the purposes of carrying out the uh, operations of this new powerful international monetary fund. Keynes, who, as I said, had objected uh, to any special status uh, for the U.S. dollar, was forced to sign the agreement uh, as he was being uh, told to check out of the hotel uh, with the other delegates and, and later complained bitterly that he hadn't even had time to read the document properly. But – it's unlikely had he had that time, he would have gotten much different in terms of results out of the negotiations, according to your story about the where the power stood. Uh, absolutely. And he, even though he had a number of fights with Harry Dexter White after the conference, um, he was trying to revise some of the provisions. He didn't even raise this one any longer because he knew he was going to lose this battle and didn't want to draw any more public attention to it. So what would the IMF do in the post-war era, uh, the way White structured it? Right. The way uh, White uh, structured um, the, the IMF, um, uh, con countries would um, uh, contribute uh, gold, uh, securities, um, U.S. dollars, and a limited amount of their own uh, domestic currency um, uh, to uh, a, a, a pool – of valuable assets um, uh, that would be used to help finance countries that were running what were seen as temporary balance of payments deficits. What White was trying to achieve was to stop those countries running balance of payments deficits from erecting uh, trade barriers um, and making uh, it more difficult for the United States uh, to export in particular. That's what he was um, uh, concerned with. He knew that in the 1930s that, um, at least in his, his mind, this was uh, the way it had happened, that um, trade broke down when um, uh, currency conflicts um, rose up. Uh, again, he, he blamed the British in particular for destroying the gold exchange standard in um, uh, uh, 1931. So he was uh, determined to establish a, a, a mechanism that would discourage countries which were running balance of payments deficits um, uh, from uh, interfering with the operation of a, a new multilateral trading fr framework, which interestingly enough would not be established until uh, three years uh, after the Bretton Woods Conference. The, the GATT was only finally agreed in 1947. General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, I think. Yeah. That, that's right, which was um, uh, the precursor to the World Trade Organization. And it turned out that we have seen uh, a steady growth in international trade since 1946, more or less. But he got some other problems along the way, which we'll, we'll get to in a sec. Uh, there wasn't a free lunch there. So before we do that, I want to I want to focus on just really eye-opening uh, 
set of economic issues between the United States and Great Britain went during the war and after, which I was unaware of. And to get there, let's first start with a thumbnail sketch of of Harry Dexter White and Keynes. And you start with White, and I have to read one line that you uh, used to describe him because I, I really loved it. You said, now in his mid-40s, White was on the tall side of short. He was five foot six, and I'm that's me. I, now I have a new way to describe myself. <laughs> I used to be five, six and three quarters, maybe five, seven, but as I've gotten older, I have to be honest, I'm really five, six, and I'm, I love calling that the tall side of short. But carry on. Tell us about White and Keynes's, um their careers and, and their personalities at uh, as they arrived at Bretton Woods. Right. Um, uh, White was uh, nine years uh, Keynes's uh, junior. Um, uh, he was uh, born in uh, 1883. He was the youngest of seven children of Lithuanian Jewish immigrants. His father was a hardware peddler. Um, he grew up in working class Boston. His parents died when he was very young. His mother when he was nine, his father when he was 16. He actually dropped out of college in his first attempt to get a degree in order to go back into the family hardware business. This was a very intelligent, ambitious man. He eventually made his way back to college. He got his um, undergraduate degree from uh, Stanford um, uh, in uh, 1924 at the age of uh, 32, uh, went on to Harvard to do his uh, PhD in economics, which he finished in 1930, but he was not able to get tenure there. He moved on to a small college in Appleton, Wisconsin, Lawrence College, where he was uh, very unhappy. Uh, and he uh, wrote to his former supervisor at Harvard, Frank Tausig, um, uh, that he uh, was studying Russian and hoped to get um, a scholarship to go to Moscow to study uh, Soviet economic planning. Uh, this man was uh, very much a, a, a political romantic, uh, somewhat out of the mainstream. Uh, when he was at Stanford, for example, he was a passionate supporter of fighting Bob LaFollette's uh, independent progressive party campaign for the presidency on a platform of nationalizing key American industries and ending American imperialism in Latin America. He fought for um, it. He fought for it, right? That was, he, uh, yeah. he agreed with it. So uh, very passionately. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, uh, Harry Dexter White was a, a man whose political passions were, always came first, and as uh, economics, he saw as a tool um, uh, to a, a, a advance um, uh, his um, uh, a political agenda. Um, and he was fascinated with the, the Russian Revolution, in particular with what he saw as the great successes of uh, uh, Soviet um, state economic planning. Uh, but before he could go off to um, uh, Moscow, he was uh, um, invited by Jacob Viner, um, University of Chicago economist who was working temporarily at the U.S. Treasury to come to Washington to work um, temporarily on a study of um, U.S. monetary and uh, banking institutions. And to make a long story very short, um, he arrived there in 1934, uh, just after uh, Henry Morgenthau, an old friend of FDR's with no background in economics, had become Treasury Secretary, and he makes himself absolutely indispensable uh, to Hen Henry Morgenthau. And the two over the next 12 years develop a very complicated symbiotic relationship uh, where Morgenthau becomes dependent on White for actionable policy ideas, which he can sell to the president. And White becomes dependent on Morgenthau in order to be able to stay in Washington and to advance within the U.S. Uh, uh, Treasury uh, and um, uh, to avoid having to go back to uh, Appleton, Wisconsin. Um, uh, now, this whole idea of an international monetary conference um, had been at the forefront of White's mind um, uh, from the time that he arrived in Washington. For example, I found a fascinating memo in uh, White's um, uh, archives um, dated 1936, um, he, he is a man literally obsessed with the relative um, uh, geopolitical and economic positions of Britain and the United States. And he writes, 
the more sterling countries there are in the world, that is the more countries that use the pound sterling or which tie their currency to the pound sterling, the stronger will be England's position around the bargaining table should an international conference take place. Now, in 1936, White is still no more than a bureaucratic temp at the U.S. Treasury, but he's already planning, eight years before Bretton Woods, a major international monetary conference at which he, Harry Dexter White, will best the British. Now, talk about Keynes. A lot of us know something about Keynes, but your portrait of him is very – It's very subtle. It's very revealing. I learned a lot about Keynes I didn't know. Um, Talk about Keynes and then we'll talk about their – the positions they found themselves in. One of the things that makes the the story so fascinating and compelling on a personal basis is the uh, enormous differences, um, uh, cultural, um, cultural. uh, let me, let, lifestyle, the way they grew up between Harry Dexter White and John Maynard Keynes. Um, uh, Keynes uh, was the son of two upper middle class Cambridge academics. He was raised by a governess and servants. Um, uh, he was expected to grow, go on to great things in life. This was certainly very different from um, uh, Harry Dexter White. Um, he had worked uh, in the um, UK Treasury briefly during uh, the, the First World War, and that's where he cut his teeth uh, in international diplomacy. All of his um, uh, official missions to Washington throughout his entire um, uh, career were begging missions. Um, so he was very, very um, uh, sensitive uh, to the fact um, that his ideas on um, uh, mon- monetary architecture needed to be actionable ideas that would um, help insulate uh, Britain from um, economic and geopolitical pressure uh, from the United States. Um, he and uh, uh, White um, uh, became uh, sort of intimate uh, interlocutors um, uh, uh, after 1942. Uh, both he and White were working on their own uh, monetary plans um, for uh, a new international monetary fund. They had enormous disagreements uh, over the institution on the role of the U.S. dollar, on the ability of countries to devalue their countries, uh, currencies independently, on whether the IMF would be a powerful institution as the uh, Americans wanted or basically um, an ATM, a cash machine for, for debtors as uh, Keynes had wanted. Uh, but because of their very, very different backgrounds and temperaments, the exchanges between the, the, the two were, were truly memorable. Um, uh, my favorite one is in um, October of uh, 1943, um, uh, White presents Keynes with um, a new version of the, the White Plan for Bretton Woods. Keynes hurls the document on the floor and yells, this is intolerable. It is yet another Talmud. Of course, uh, the word Talmud is a reference to White being uh, Jewish. Uh, and, he, White he calls, and, she, and he calls White the Talmudist in, uh, occasionally. Exactly. <laughs> he also refers to him as the Grand Rabbi. Yeah, I view those uh, as compliments. I don't think Keynes did. <laughs> That's no, my impression. He did not. Yeah. But uh, White's response was also memorable. He bowed and said, well, we will try to produce something which your highness can understand. <laughs> so the part of the story that I was really um, unaware of, it, I'm a casual student in World War II. I've you know, read a bunch of books on it, but I don't, I don't read systematically on it. And I, you, know, you think about the war and you think about the fact it's well known that there was a strong isolationist uh, part of the United States that, that – um, Roosevelt was more eager to get into the war perhaps than the American people, that mm-hmm. Pearl Harbor is what eventually precipitated our involvement in the war in Europe because Germany uh, declared war on the United States, which is a fascinating uh, part of history. They didn't have – they had a, they had a uh, treaty with Japan, and when the U.S. and the Japan were at war, uh, Germany uh, held, up, held, up, held their treaty, yeah. which is – which is held up the treaty, which is shocking really, um, a really bad move on Germany's part. Um, 
ultimately you could argue cost them the war. So when we think about the U.S.-British relationship, my thought is, well, you know, we got into the war later, but we helped a lot before because we gave them a lot of stuff. And you talk very um, informatively of how that relationship worked, which I didn't know much about, which is the Lend-Lease program. And yeah. I, what I learned, and I'm going to I'm going to give away the punchline because it's it, it's a, there's some details to go through, but the punchline's amazing. Uh, the war broke Britain uh, financially, and the U.S. relationship with Britain over this was remarkably contentious. I didn't realize yeah. how contentious it was. So, talk about how lend lease got started and why it was important, uh, and why it ultimately affected Keynes's and the British delegation's bargaining position. Well, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill famously referred to American lend-lease aid during the war as, quote, quote unquote, the most unsorted act. Uh, but Churchill was painfully aware of the fact that lend-lease aid um, uh, came with um, uh, very objectionable economic and geopolitical conditions, all of which, interestingly enough, um, uh, had been devised by the U.S. Treasury. Um, uh, FDR uh, certainly had quite a bit of uh, anti-British uh, animus, but he had no intention of using uh, lend-lease aid in um, uh, any way to um, uh, reduce Britain's role in the post-war world. This was very much um, uh, an object of the U.S. Treasury. The Treasury exploited the fact that um, uh, Congress insisted um, that the United States should go get, quote unquote, consideration for Lend-Lease aid. And the, the Treasury basically devised um, uh, three types of consideration that they uh, were demanding from the British. Before, before, Her, you do, before you talk about the three, the three types, to say what it literally was. We were sending munitions, mm -hmm. right? We were sending – yeah, weapons. It was an ab absolutely um, a brilliant uh, contrivance of um, FDR um, to get around the fact that um, uh, Congress uh, didn't want to um, give uh, Britain uh, any sides. more financial. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, Britain had uh, defaulted on its World War One debts, and there was a lot of bitterness um, uh, toward the British. So uh, FDR came up with this um, uh, uh, idea um, that we would not uh, uh, give them aid, we would not uh, simply lend them money, um, uh, we would have a swap. Uh, we would give them things that they need, they would give them us things that uh, we need. Um, if they couldn't um, uh, give us these things now, uh, they would just return the items that we um, loaned them after the war. Uh, such a FDR strange did. idea. These are airplanes yeah. and tanks and Absolutely. trucks and f food. I, I, I don't <laughs> – But FDR used it's a marketing. This, um, it's a marketing plan. Well, yeah, of course it is, uh, br but brilliant um, political marketing. He used a garden hose analogy. He said if your neighbor's house is burning down – um, you don't try to sell them a garden hose. You lend them your garden hose, and after the fire is put out, he gives it back to you. So this is the way um, uh, FDR tried to uh, sell aid to Britain uh, politically. Uh, but this, as I said, was not uh, enough for Congress, and it was certainly not enough uh, for the U.S. Treasury and two men in particular, um, uh, Henry Morgenthau, um, and Harry Dexter White, who uh, not you know, I mean, you brought up the fact um, uh, that uh, White had um, uh, engaged in some fascinating freelance diplomacy on behalf of the Soviet Union. But the counterpart to that was that he was very anti-imperialist. He was very much um, uh, uh, against the old um, uh, European imperial powers, um, uh, Colonial Britain order. and France in, in particular, and he was determined to force liquidation of the British Empire after the war. So the three things um, the Treasury demanded were, first, that Britain after the war would have to end imperial trade preference. This is the arrangement by which... Um, uh, uh, Britain gave itself privileged access to the markets of its uh, colonies and dominions. Uh, second, it would have to make the pound sterling once again fully convertible into U.S. dollars at um, uh, a fixed uh, 
and overvalued exchange rate on a fixed date after the war. That date was ultimately set at July 15, 1947, a day that would live in infamy for the British because it effectively marked um, their bankruptcy. Their colonies and dominions were braying uh, to convert their worthless sterling into dollars. And on July 15, 1947, they were finally able to do so. And finally, Britain would, at Bretton Woods, accept the U.S. dollar as the uh, a foundation of um, uh, a new um, uh, world economic order um, after the war. Um, uh, these were all seen as very objectionable um, conditions uh, in Britain, but as uh, British Bretton Woods delegate and famous economist in his own right, Lionel Robbins, put it at Bretton Woods, quote unquote, we needed the cash. Yeah, they didn't – they were um... – they were out of money. They were out of. They couldn't they, buy any more tanks. They couldn't buy any more stuff. They couldn't, and they couldn't produce enough on their own. Obviously, at the time, they were desperate. Um, so these, of course, are remarkably unpleasant, as you as you point out from the British perspective. Um, and um, but they they felt like they were over. We they were over barrel. They they didn't have a choice. Right, but there there was, I should emphasize, quite a bit of uh, controversy within the British civil service about what to do. Um, some top civil servants, one of whom I talk about in the book, Sir Richard Clark, Otto Clark, uh, as he was known, was scathing about um, Keynes' strategy of cooperating with the U.S. Treasury. Um, he did not want to go into uh, Bretton Woods under the conditions that the Americans were demanding. He said, look, um, we can borrow this money from other sources. We can borrow more from the Canadians. We can borrow from the American Import-Export Bank, which didn't have this geopolitical agenda. And borrow most from the, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. And most importantly, we could borrow the money privately. And in fact, there was a rear guard action um, launched in May of 1944, just before the Bretton Woods Conference, by a group of influential New York bankers who very much um, hated the Bretton Woods uh, 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 agenda. They offered to um, lend Britain at least uh, $3 uh, billion uh, after the war, in, re in return for which Britain would walk away from uh, the Bretton Woods uh, Conference. Clark and others in the British Treasury wanted to pursue this idea, but Keynes would have none of it. And this, I think, was uh, perhaps Keynes's most conspicuous weakness as a diplomat, that he really had a vested interest um, in the Bretton Woods agenda. He knew that White's um, uh, blueprint for Bretton Woods would win out in the short term, but he hoped that his blueprint would print would lit, win out in the long run because he wanted to be known as the man who overthrew the gold standard and replaced it with a new rational managed international monetary system. So he very much had his own personal uh, legacy um, uh, at heart here. And I don't think he always uh, uh, fully recognized uh, the options that he could have pursued um, in order to uh, avoid these terms that the Americans were requiring. Well, he was an economist, uh, and he uh, he had a characteristic, as many economists do, which disturbs me deeply as a uh, fellow economist, that well, we want to run the world. And um, a single system, someone gets to run it and probably should be the smartest person, and that would be Keynes. Uh, so mm -hmm. I think he probably thought somewhere down the line he would continue to influence, if not manage, such a world system. I certainly thought I – th I think it's true he thought he would, he would certainly influence it. Um, but going back to Lend-Lease for a minute, so at the end of the war – this is the part that's uh, – again, I knew nothing about. At the end of the war, we, we presented the British with a very large bill um, yeah. of money that they owed us. And um, w was that – uh, how did that interact? That well, was that was lend lease. That was wh wh you know we 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 didn't really I I expect to to get um, that money back. Uh, the big conflict with the the British after the war um, was um, over British demands that the Americans uh, should basically give them a, a, a gift of a few billion dollars. This was Keynes's idea. 
um, uh, to account for the va- fact that Britain had entered the war much earlier than the United States and had effectively been uh, forced to fight on its own in a common cause. And the Americans naturally found this perspective extremely offensive. Uh, so when Keynes uh, went um, uh, to Washington in uh, September of 1945 uh, for his last major begging trip, he had convinced the British uh, government that they should not accept any more loans from the United States, that that would be extremely offensive. Uh, and when just put the um, uh, United Kingdom further in hock to the Americans, uh, we should demand, quote unquote, justice. Uh, we should demand that the um, uh, 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 Americans um, uh, uh, pay us for the services that we rendered in the common cause. Um, uh, the Americans um, scoffed at this idea and basically offered Britain a loan, uh, which Keynes, as usual, was um, uh, ultimately forced to accept. The British government was furious at him because he had convinced them the, that they uh, should not and uh, take a loan and would not ultimately have to take a loan. This loan was ultimately paid off. You know when, Russ? I do because I read your book. <laughs> 2006. No, that's, that blew me away. I, that just yeah. – it's stunning. And it, But of course along the way, uh, Britain went from being a world power to – an important yeah. country with 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 important things that that it contributes and 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 great uh, achievements, but it did not. It was not uh, a, on top of the world the way it had been, or at least close to, uh, in the run up to World War One or even World War Two. It was uh, marginalized as a player, at least at the national level in the international monetary system. Now you could argue that's not really important, but I think what is important, you know, that's some of that's ego, some of that's national pride, which is, I think, silly. But the part that is important is that England just was broke. They they didn't have much economic capacity. And what economic capacity they had in the aftermath of World War II was um, a lot of it went to – is it true? How much of it went to to finance the debts they had run up in, in the war? Well, in, in enormous. Uh, the um, uh, on the eve of World War One, uh, Brit- Britain's debt to GDP ratio was about twenty five percent. By the time we um, uh, get to Bretton Woods, it was about two hundred and fifty percent. So Britain had gone from the world's uh, largest creditor nation to the world's largest debtor nation, and this is a very, very important part of my story, I think, in terms of understanding uh, contemporary international economic affairs as well. This was effectively Bretton Woods, a negotiation between the world's largest creditor nation, the United States, and the world's largest debtor nation, Great Britain, um, uh, over the terms of a new international monetary architecture. And naturally, the position that the U.S. government t- took was very creditor-friendly. Of course, today the disputes are are mainly between uh, China and the United States today, China being the world's largest international creditor nation, the United States being the world's largest uh, debtor nation. And the position that the U.S. government takes today in such discussions is almost precisely the position that Keynes and the British had taken uh, during World War II. Explain. Uh, Well... Uh, remember and I, back say, in- I say explain because the dollar remains the closest thing to a, an international currency. It's in, it's Absolutely. threatened. It's threatened, but that's not the situation. The, the, the sterling uh, pound sterling was not the uh, the world's currency at, at the time of Bretton Woods. So explain what what you say the U.S. position today is like the British. In what way? Ooh. Right. Um, uh, you might remember back in 2010, former Treasury Secretary Tim Geithner proposed that there should be uh, caps imposed on persistent current account surpluses. Um, uh, that is, that there should be uh, financial consequences for countries. Of course, this was directed first and foremost at China that run persistent current account Um, uh, surpluses that were essentially abusing their creditor position. This was precisely the position which Keynes and the British uh, 
um, had taken at Bretton Woods. Keynes actually wanted to impose financial penalties on the United States for running these uh, persistent um, uh, creditor positions. And Harry Dexter White and the U.S. Treasury would have absolutely none of this. Um, uh, he uh, warned the U.S. delegation before they went off into um, uh, negotiations at Bretton Woods that the British and others were going to be demanding this, but we would not tolerate any foreign interference in the operation of um, uh, our uh, current account surpluses. And of course, this is really the position that China takes um, uh, today. So uh, where you stand depends on where you sit. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so uh, the, the United States supported fixed exchange rates during World War II uh, when the pressure on its currency was up, and the United States uh, supports uh, floating exchange rates today when the pressure on its currency is down. And it sees countries like China that try to fix their exchange rate as interfering uh, with a more competitive dollar. So I just want to clarify one thing going back to the, uh, the British debt. Mm -hmm. uh, two things. One, of course, I, I cannot but note the irony that this, uh, and I, I think it's this is this is half um, humorous, but it's half very serious. Which is that uh, Britain ran large deficits during World War II, which did not stimulate their economy. I just I want to get that in. I, th I hate it when people say <laughs> that war spending is good for the economy um, or borrowing to finance uh, war is good for the economy. It's I think that's a terrible uh, argument. I don't think it's true, and I think it leads to. Encouragement of war. I think it's a bad idea. But I want to make sure I understand. When you say that Britain's uh, debt to GDP ratio was very high in 1945, I think you said 250 uh, percent. Who did they owe that money to? Was that to the U.S. as a result of the Lend-Lease program? The U.S. Uh, Canadians, their their colonies, uh, their colonies and dominions mainly. And it, did anybody in England say, "Well, we just need to walk away from it rather than pay it"? Uh, walk walk away from the, the uh, from from the the debt. Well, they certainly hope to um, uh, walk away from their um, U.S. debts. And Keynes had argued um, uh, that uh, their debts to some of the colonies and dominions, for example, South Africa, um, should be written off uh, because um, uh, those countries, uh, he argued, had in many cases benefited from the war. Um, and certainly benefited from um, uh, the efforts that Britain had made um, uh, on behalf of, um, of, uh, of, of the collective. Uh, so um, Britain, Britain, didn't, uh, Britain didn't want to, quote unquote, walk away from the debts, but they wanted uh, other countries to acknowledge that they had made great sacrifices um, on their behalf and that those countries uh, should therefore willingly uh, write off some of Britain's debts. And you know, there, you can certainly tell that story uh, that that Britain made great. Britain did make great sacrifices. They lost a lot. Yes. They're, they were bombed every night, and they they died. And they went to France when France laid down its arms. And Britain made the war is very expensive in the real sense of the term, not just in money. But you point out that most Americans at the time didn't didn't feel any gratitude. They felt that Europe's always getting itself in a mess, and we always bail them out, which was Quite World War the One. Opposite. Exactly, and that's that's just uh, fasting. Exactly, that the Europeans keep dragging us into their conflicts, uh, and this has become extremely costly for us, not uh, just um, in terms of national treasure, but in in terms of lives, American yeah. lives. So let's talk just for a minute because it's it's a side note, but it's such an, an interesting one. Henry Morgenthau was um, Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, talk about what his plan for Germany. I mean, this is just extraordinary. Again, an episode of history I do nothing about. What was his plan for post-war Germany, and what was the um, impact of that plan being announced, even though it was never implemented? Yeah, uh, let me put it in a wider context, um, uh, one that involves um, Bretton Woods, so you, you can you can understand uh, uh, my perspective on the on the failings of Bretton Woods. There were really four major foundational ideas. Um, that Morgan Thalen White brought into um, uh, Bretton Woods. Uh, the first was that the uh, British Empire could be peaceably dismantled. Um, the second was that the Soviet Union could be co-opted into a permanent peacetime alliance. The third was that Britain could be uh, profitably uh, dismantled 
and um, uh, dismembered, broken it up into pieces, and deindustrialized. This was the Germany. You just said Britain. You yeah. meant Germany. Uh, I'm sorry. I apologize. Yeah. Germany. Yeah. Uh, Germany could be uh, deindustrialized. This was the uh, Morgenthau plan for post-war Germany. Essentially, he was going to turn Germany into an agricultural nation. And finally, um, that uh, a multilateral trading system could be constructed on the basis of making short-term loans to countries making balance of payments deficits. Now, all of these things um, uh, turned out to be completely misconceived. Um, if you fast forward um, uh, three years um, to 1947 and the launch of the Marshall Plan, you see it's all founded um, uh, on the fact uh, that the uh, FDR administration had gotten this all wrong. Uh, Britain's imperial collapse was very rapid and violent in 1947, and this was causing enormous uh, trouble for the United States. Uh, it was when um, uh, Britain walked out of Greece in February of 1947 because it was running out of dollars um, uh, that the uh, Truman administration uh, decided that they had to uh, launch the, so the so-called Truman Doctrine. Um, uh, second, the uh, Soviets, um, uh, of course, at this point, uh, so were no, lo <laughs> no longer, <laughs> no, and they're, they're not seen as potential allies. Obviously, uh, they're they're not seen as a country that can be co-opted into any sort of um, uh, alliance. They have to be contained. In George Kennan's uh, famous words, and Kennan had been scathing about the U.S. Treasury uh, under FDR. Um, uh, with regard to Germany. Uh, the United States did a complete 180 in 1947. Um, Morgenthau had been warned um, over and over by um, uh, the, the, the War Department and the uh, uh, State Department that his plan would lead to um, uh, civilian catastrophe in Germany, mass starvation, and would lead um, to enormous costs to the United States that would be forced to prop it up. He didn't, he didn't buy it. He didn't care. Uh, but when we get to 1947, now it becomes a priority of the United States to turn G Western Germany um, into a, a bulwark against Soviet expansionism by making it the new industrial engine of an integrated Western Europe. So this is really 180 degrees from what uh, Morgenthau had uh, uh, planned. And the actual script writer for the Morgenthau plan was um, uh, Harry Dexter White. Morgenthau wanted to go farther than White, but uh, White actually wrote the blueprint. And what was the fourth one? What was the fourth piece of the... The fourth, the fourth one was basically the establishment of the IMF, that the IMF, which would lend money to countries running balance of payments deficits, would revive a global trading system. This turned out to be complete and utter nonsense. Uh, people forget today, but the IMF was basically mothballed by the Truman administration. It did nothing for the rest of the 1940s, and for most of the 1950s, it was the Marshall Plan that began to revive um, uh, the uh, European uh, economy, and it was the establishment of the European Payments Union in 1950 that began to um, uh, revive some form of multilateral trade within Europe. It was not the IMF. So, you know, this idea of lending ever more money to bankrupt nations in order to um, uh, stimulate trade, you can see that's not particularly working out very well in the Eurozone, and it certainly didn't work out after World War II. So really, FDR's Treasury got this completely wrong at Bretton Woods. I'm going to add a fifth one. Uh, a fifth goal that they had, which I got from your book, which was they were very eager for the IMF and the World Bank to be in Washington, D.C. rather than New York City. And they were very Not only eager. eager, they demanded it, and, despite the fact that Keynes was bitterly, bitterly opposed to it. And the reason being that they wanted to have more influence. Uh, they, they had hoped to have more influence over the international monetary system coming from the uh, Treasury and the and and. Washington rather than from the banking community. But of course, right. the banking community today, as we look back on this, uh, it, it's still pretty influential, I think, unfortunately. Uh, but that's the way, that's the that didn't work out so well, I, I don't think. In the well, one of the reasons that um, uh, the FDR administration was in, and the Truman administration was insistent that the the World Bank and IMF be in Washington uh, 
and not New York was that they wanted to keep the the, the bankers away from this. Um, uh, Henry Morgenthau in uh, 1945, uh, when he was e- explaining to President Truman uh, what he had uh, set out to achieve um, at Bretton Woods, he said, I wanted, quote unquote, to move the financial center of the world from London and Wall Street to the United States Treasury. Note the on Wall Street part. This is very much an anti-banker agenda. Yeah, th- those bankers are hard to keep down, though. Um, didn't, <laughs> didn't, uh, didn't work out. Uh, didn't work out so Not well. Not quite as they had planned, though. No. Yeah, uh, but just to stay one more second with the Morgenthau plan. What I found extraordinary about it is that the Germans, the Morgenthau plan to deindustrialize Germany, was announced during the war which motivated the German army apparently. And I found it remarkable that in the – having lived through Versailles and the settlement of, of War I and the reparations, which Keynes appears to have been prescient about, that in the yeah. aftermath of World War II, Morgenthau was going to do the same thing. Yeah, he even, he even uh, quipped, although he seemed um, uh, to be half serious about it, about taking away German children and re-educating them. Um, he believed that there was uh, something fundamental in the um, uh, German psyche that had to be um, uh, 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 addressed um, uh, through radical reform of the country, and that included taking away its um, its entire industry. Um, so he had uh, no confidence whatsoever that Germany could ever become a, a peaceful industrial democracy. Well, he had two data points. Uh- <laughs> one world, two world wars. One of which probably was not Germany's, Germany's fault, although at the time I think many people uh, thought thought that it was. Um, but the idea that you'd impoverish, you'd, you'd keep people from hurting you by impoverishing them, was would think that strategy had been shown to be not so effective. Uh, but anyway, well, by 1947, the the bill for supporting um, uh, Germany uh, to the United States had become enormous. Um, so it was uh, it was clear that uh, not only was the the policy um, hurting Germans, um, but it was hurting the United States because unless Germany could um, uh, pay its way in the world, it wasn't going to be able to feed its own people. Yeah, um, I just but the part just talk for a second about um, the impact on the German war effort. Yes, the Morgenthau plan was um, uh, a huge uh, propaganda coup for uh, Hitler and Goebbels. Um, uh, They um, used it relentlessly to motivate the German troops uh, to convince them that the United States was determined to enslave um, uh, Germans uh, after the war. Um, And if they uh, did not fight on um, uh, to the uh, bitter death, uh, they were going to meet an uh, ignominious um, uh, mass starvation a- after the war. And many um, uh, U.S. commanders believed that um, uh, the war uh, lasted longer than it needed to have um, with um, uh, many more U.S. casualties because of the Morgenthau plan and how um, uh, the Nazi government was able to use this in its propaganda. So this grand achievement at the time, which you know Harry Dexter White was, I'm sure, very proud of, and uh, it appeared to be a triumph for the Americans. Uh, this happens in um, uh, it's in 1944. It's yes, yeah. it takes a while to be you know signed, implemented, etc. But most people, I think you do in the book, call the 1946 through 1971 period the the Bretton Woods era. Uh, we're ending in 71 when the U.S. goes off the gold standard. But you're suggesting that it really even wasn't that much Bretton Woodsy about 1946 to 71 and that the IMF no. was relatively was relatively unimportant. So my question is this, two questions. I could spend another hour on this, but sorry, try to, try to make it brief. <laughs> it's a tough question. Um, it would seem to me that uh, the we, – we muddled through with something. So tell me – I'm not sure what it was – but certainly in the aftermath of Bretton Woods, it was the Milton Friedman era, uh, floating exchange yeah. rates, which mm-hmm. which no one thought possible other than Friedman for a while. And uh, eventually the world came to say, like, hey, this is pretty good. So talk about how that transition – do the best you can in talking about how that transition occurred and uh, the world we live in now. 
Yeah, I, I should emphasize that um, there's a, a, a lot of um, uh, mythology about Keynes that really doesn't hold up to scrutiny. He was not um, in favor of fluctuating uh, exchange rates. Um, he was in favor of stable exchange rates. He wanted uh, Britain to have um, complete uh, autonomy over its um, exchange rate, but he argued very, very passionately against British devaluation after the war, which turned out to be a huge mistake because when Britain did wind up uh, devaluing by 30% in 1949, um, its financial problems started dissipating uh, very, very quickly. So um, uh, uh, this was uh, – Friedman um, was really very much uh, uh, on his own here. Um, certainly, uh, flexible exchange rates were not uh, part of the political debate um, at Bretton Woods. I should emphasize that the Bretton Woods monetary system, the system uh, set up by Harry Dexter White at Bretton Woods, could not really be said to have started until 1961, because it was only in 61 that the first nine European countries uh, met the convertibility requirements of uh, IMF uh, Article 8. Um, so this is um, uh, already 17 years after the Bretton Woods Conference, and by the time we get to 1961, the system's already coming under extreme strain as the United States is losing gold reserves. Um, uh, now, Harry Dexter White said that this could never happen. Uh, there could never come a day when the U.S. would not be able to uh, credibly back its uh, currency with gold. But he insisted that should that day ever come, uh, the international role of the U.S. dollar would be finished. Uh, of course, Milton Friedman thought that this was um, uh, absolute nonsense. And I think the post-1971 uh, era, for all its difficulties, this is far from a nirvana uh, system, really uh, uh, bore him out. So what would have happened if – speculate for a minute on what would have happened if there had been a, a big uh, fight at Bretton Woods, which there were a few. But suppose they – as they exited the hotel and they said, signed here, nobody signed, uh, and they just mm. went back to – what 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 would have possibly emerged, if anything, rather than the attempt – at a top-down system that Bretton Woods represented. Uh, well, I, the symbolism of Bretton Woods, uh, of 44 allied nations uh, coming together and agreeing on a new grand architecture, I think was very powerful. Uh, but I, I think the important thing to emphasize is that very little of this um, actually became operational um, uh, after the war. Um, in, in fact, um, the IMF d directors in 49 and again in 52 issued a f um, uh, official statements lamenting the fact um, that the problem of uh, inconvertible uh, currencies and countries resorting to um, uh, a barter was actually worse than it was in the 1930s. Um, so what was it that um, uh, revived uh, the international trading system after the war? Again, I would point to uh, two policy initiatives in particular. First and foremost, the Marshall Plan, which was a very different idea from uh, Bretton Woods. The Truman administration um, uh, rejected the idea of lending more money to bankrupt countries. We had to do it in uh, uh, the form of, of grants. And second, the European um, uh, Payments Union that allowed um, the Europeans to reconstruct some semblance of a multilateral trading system within um, uh, Europe. So I wouldn't give uh, Bretton Woods uh, any credit for the economic successes of the 1950s. As I said, the IMF was um, uh, no more than a bystander during this period. So uh, I have a lot of friends who work at the IMF and the World Bank. They're good people. Mm -hmm. I like them. They're great economists. They're smart. Uh, they have good intentions. But I've often felt, um, sorry to say, that if they were um, – they'd never come to be, that the world would be a better place. Well, uh, I should emphasize, Russ, that the, I, the institution that the IMF is today was never one that was envisioned by Keynes or White. And despite the disagreements between the two, uh, both of them uh, would have objected uh, vehemently to what the IMF had, uh, has become, essentially a crisis firefighter. Neither Keynes nor White ever wanted the IMF to, to pl play a major role – 
in um, uh, uh, dealing with crises. It was supposed to be an institution that would help prevent crises, but if crises emerged, uh, the countries that were at the source of it were supposed to change their domestic policies. So this may be right, this may be wrong, this, uh, uh, but uh, I should emphasize that the IMF is a very powerful and important institution uh, today because of a blueprint that is wholly different from the one that was established at Bretton Woods. It could be a good book on how that happened. <laughs> I mean, maybe there is such a book, but um, – and similarly, the World Bank, which – as you pointed out earlier, the development part was tacked on. That has become its semi – it's become its public mandate. I think it's done a, a very poor job at helping uh, poor countries get rich and um, I, I think it's been a bad thing. I should uh, point out uh, one anecdote about um, uh, Bretton Woods with regard to the leadership of those institutions that I, I think is uh, quite interesting, a legacy of Harry Dexter White's freelance diplomacy that lives on uh, to today. Why does an American run the World Bank today and a European run the IMF when it was clear um, that the IMF was a much more important um, institution to the United States? Uh, well, in January of 46, Truman nominates Harry Dexter White to be the first U.S. executive director of the fund and is going to nominate him to be the first managing director, the head of the fund. But when FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover gets wind of it, he writes a long memorandum to the president telling him not even to think of such a thing because he, Hoover, can prove that White is in fact a Soviet spy. Now, uh, Truman uh, didn't trust Hoover but knew he that, that he had an enormous political problem on his hands. And though his uh, Secretary of State and Treasury Secretary wanted White out of government entirely, uh, Truman didn't want to draw attention to this. He argued that he could quarantine White as the U.S. Executive Director. He just wouldn't nominate him to be the Managing Director. So in March of uh, 1946, just before the Savannah Conference to inaugurate the IMF, uh, the uh, U.S. Treasury Secretary Fred Vinson tells a uh, shocked Keynes uh, that the administration had decided after due consideration that it wanted presidency of the World Bank and that it um, uh, did not want to take um, uh, the head of the IMF as well because um, that would be ungracious of the United States to demand the heads of both institutions. Uh, so the only reason why a European still continues to head the IMF to this day uh, is because of President Truman's efforts to uh, cover up the uh, growing white spy scandal. And of course, as you point out in the book, uh, there wasn't just a wild theory of J. Edgar Hoover. There appears to be quite a bit of evidence that uh, he was correct. Although and the Hoover White... knew very little of it. And knew... it, it came very... out later, right? Much later. And yes. uh, although the White family continues to protest his, his innocence, it, um, it appears to be that he – it should be – I want to clarify this though – he did not – he was not in the pay of the Soviet Union. He did it out of uh, misplaced uh, love for what he thought was their um, economic success and, and, and importance of, of being part of the world community, correct? He did uh, – Absolutely. Well, I should be they're, careful. He took, a, he took a rug. He took some yeah, uh, yeah. liquor, but he was not <laughs> – right? When you talk about that, his yeah. daughter's – I was just going to, uh, to bring that up there. There is some evidence that he, he had some – that he had some gifts – uh, and Soviet intelligence cables also uh, suggest that um, uh, White's uh, wife had uh, agreed to let the uh, Soviets uh, fund their daughter's education after the war. Um, uh, they wanted to uh, leave Washington. Um, his wife wanted uh, White to uh, go into the private sector and start earning some money. The uh, Soviets were naturally very much against that given how important White was to them. Uh, so they um, uh, offered to help fund uh, the white daughter's uh, education. As, as I said, at least the cable suggests that that was uh, favorably received. But it wasn't like he was passing documents and accepting uh, bags of money. He um, mostly just passed documents. He was documents. certainly passing documents. Yes. He, uh, he copied um, uh, classified documents. Um, he wrote down um, uh, classified information that um, uh, he was uh, privy to at meetings and uh, passed them on to his um, uh, conduits, uh, both American interlocutors and to um, uh, Soviet agents in the United States posing, for example, as uh, news reporters. 
My guest today has been Ben Steele. Ben, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thanks so much for having me, Russ. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.